ladies and gentlemen. For the uh, continuation of our program, we are now very pleased to welcome Bill Flynn to speak here at the Wings Club Foundation Luncheon. Bill is the President and Chief Executive Officer of Atlas Air Worldwide Holdings. Atlas Air provides global air freight services and also serves the military and passenger charter markets. Bill has had a distinguished 40-year career in transportation and supply chain management. He joined Atlas Air in June 2006. Uh, previously, he was president and CEO of Geologistics and held senior positions with CSX Transportation and Sealand Service. Bill serves on the board of directors of Ports America, uh, LLC, Airlines for America, and business executives for national security. Uh, the Financial Times named Bill as one of the five outstanding corporate directors in 2014. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Bill Flynn. For today's interview session, we are very pleased to have Joe Anselmo uh, with us again. Joe is Editor-in-Chief uh, for Aviation Week, uh, Week Network. Uh, in 2017, Aviation Week was honored as the best business-to-business -business media brand in Jesse H. Neal National Business Journalism Awards. And Joe has covered a wide array of businesses, um, political, military, and technological issues with Aviation Week, Congressional Quarterly, and the Washington Post. Welcome, Joe. Please join me on stage. Thanks for joining us. And the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we're going to talk for a little bit, but we are definitely going to leave time at the end uh, for questions from the audience. So uh, please uh, prepare your questions for us, because I think you're, you're ready for them. Um, let, let's start out with um, the basics. I mean, everyone in this room knows UPS. They know FedEx. They've probably heard of Atlas Air, but not everybody knows what Atlas Air does. So could you explain for us how Atlas Air sort of fits into the sure. cargo picture? And then maybe talk a little bit about those ama that amazing growth uh, and profits that you've been able to generate the last few years. Great. Thanks, Joe. But before I do, I want to thank you, Frank, and, and thanks the, uh, thank the Wings Club for, for the invitation to be here today. I've been a member since uh, 2006, so it's, it's great, to, great to be back. And, just one more uh, story. I was reminiscing with Candace. Um, last time I spoke here was 10 years ago, um, January, February 2009, and it was the worst snowstorm we had that year. So now we've got this rainstorm. I, you know, I think we've got to move to spring or summer, or otherwise uh, I'll, I'll continue to uh, jinx the weather. Uh, so talk about Atlas Air. So we're uh, Atlas Air Worldwide Holdings. That's, that's a publicly traded company. We're NASDAQ uh, listed. Uh, we, Currently, have th we operate three airlines, three airline certificates. Uh, the original Atlas Air Inc., and we just celebrated our, our 25th uh, anniversary of flying back in uh, last year, 2018. We own uh, Polar Air Cargo, and in uh, 2008, we sold uh, a 49% interest in Polar to DHL Express. So DHL is our largest customer, and Polar Air Cargo, this joint venture we have with, with DHL, provides the majority, uh, but not all the flying, that we do for, for DHL Express. Atlas started out operating a single aircraft type, the 747 uh, freighter intercontinentally. Um, and as we've grown over the years, it became clear to us that in order to, to better serve our customers and take advantage of growth opportunities, we, we should continue to diversify the fleet type. And so um, we added 767s uh, in the 2009, 2010 timeframe. And then in 2016, we acquired uh, another airline, Southern Air Cargo, who operated and operates 777s and 737s. So what, what that acquisition allowed us to do was to work with our customers, look at the growing uh, air freight market, whether it be the long haul intercontinental uh, market or a regional domestic market, and, and be in a position that we could offer our customer the right aircraft and the right service for the market uh, uh, niche or the market uh, uh, trade lanes that, that they wanted to serve. <clears throat> Ultimately, we're going to integrate Southern 
into Atlas and the certificate will disappear. It'll, it'll just be all Atlas and, and we hope to get that done in the next, uh, in the next couple of years. Uh, Polar, of course, will stay independent with the joint venture uh, with DHL. And then uh, th another uh, wing or, or element of the business is we started to develop a aircraft leasing company. So we're, we're not going to take on GCAS or, or AirCap in terms of passenger aircraft leasing. But we're focused um, on freighters. We, we know the freight market pretty well. We understand freighter operations. And so um, really for the last five or six years, we've been growing out a leasing business. The name is Titan. And um, it continues to grow. And um, it's got a pretty good sized freighter fleet now. And so we've got a decent position in the, in, in the freighter market. So, so our growth has been about diversification. Uh, all business, all of our businesses start with the customer. Uh, we've been able to grow over the last several years by really focusing on the express and e-commerce market. That's where our growth has come from. And then and beyond that, um, higher growth, uh, long haul intercontinental trade lanes, uh, for sure. Uh, I talked about diversifying the aircraft types. And we've grown a passenger business as well. It's, it really fundamentally serves the military. 15% of what we do uh, is flying cargo and passengers for the military. So to the second part of your question, uh, we've had a lot of growth in the last three years. The, the, the air freight market was pretty flat between 2010 and 2013. It was really one of the first times that uh, the industries observed where global trade was growing, expanding 3 4% a year, but air freight was flat. And, and, and the same was true in international ocean shipping, which which had really never been observed before because uh, trade flows tended to grow at some percentage greater than, yeah. than trade. But now you've got, um, you've got actually a contraction or a flatness. So um, uh, that really catalyzed in 15 and 16. And, and since 15, we've uh, essentially doubled the company. The number of aircraft, revenue, the flight hours, um, and earnings followed. So that was good. So. Right. So that, that's been the growth, and it's really been in those segments. You had, you had mentioned e-commerce. Maybe you could tell us a little bit more about the role that e-commerce plays in that growth. And I know Amazon is, is one of your major customers. Yeah. Well, e-commerce is obviously an important part of that growth. Certainly, we, we know that here. and The domestic flows that we operate, 20 aircraft for Amazon, uh, now and another carrier does as well. A lot of what we're flying for DHL uh, is e-commerce. It's hard, it's hard to know what's... What the growth, how much of that is traditional express and how much of that is, is e-commerce, but clearly e-commerce is an important part of it. Uh, we fly for FedEx and UPS. Um, and seasonally, we don't fly for them year round, but during their peak seasons, the holiday seasons, we certainly have a number of aircraft that we, we fly uh, in, in their networks. Used to be we, we'd fly the two weeks before Christmas because that's when they experienced peak. Now it starts Thanksgiving. And it goes about a week after Christmas because of returns. So there's a, so there's a, lot, of, uh, a lot of volume moving. And um, it's hard to say where it all goes. If you, if you, at least the statistics that we've read, e-commerce represents about 12% of retail sales in the US. You and I would think it'd be a lot higher. But it's around 12%. And half of that's streaming media. Right? That's books and Netflix and everything else. So, so when you think about it physically, it's a relatively small amount of the volume that's moving. So uh, most clicks happen after 7 p.m. Most of us want it tomorrow or you know, within 24 hours. And I think that's really catalyzing fairly significant, sustainable demand on air freight. Okay. And, and as e-commerce grows, I know you can't talk about customers specifically, so I, I won't mention any specific customers. But do you worry at all that the, the e-commerce companies could decide to go it alone, you know, start their own well, services. But you know, I, I remember some years ago, uh, uh, one of the, an investor or, or one of the market analysts asked us, you know, who's your biggest competitor? And, and when you're in the outsourcing business, it's your customer deciding that they could do it better, smarter, faster, cheaper, right? So that that's true. Whether no matter what form of outsourcing uh, services you may be in. So, so clearly a you know, guiding principle for us, we've got to be a better choice. We have to create more value. We have to deliver service. Uh, we have to be easier to do business than your own internal you know, flight organization. Uh, think of it however way you want. So certainly our customers could uh, decide to do more or all of, of their flying for themselves at some point in the future. They, 
because that'll, that'll be up to them. But, but I think as we look at e-commerce broadly and the international freight flows, there's a lot of growth opportunity. And, 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 and we think you know, beyond what we do with a DHL or, and, and certainly now Amazon and the seasonal flying that we, we do for um, a FedEx and UPS, we've just started flying for SF Express. I don't know how many people in the room know who SF Express is. All right, Shunfeng Express, right? It's, it's a company you've not heard of. They're an express operator in, in China, and their daily, their daily domestic volume is greater than FedEx's daily domestic volume in the US, right? So it's not a small company. And, and uh, they're, they're, they've started up, obviously serving the domestic Chinese market, but now they're starting to fly internationally. And, and they're flying for Alibaba, and they're flying for, for other uh, Chinese e-commerce operators. So, so that. 10, 15 kind of percent penetration of retail um, is, is practically true glo globally. Actually, Chinese retail is penetration is a little higher in the domestic market. So I think there's a great gro growth opportunity, even as, as economies slow or you know, moderate over time, um, e-commerce e is off and running and it favors air. Okay, and for your growth opportunities, I mean, regionally, you brought up China, where, 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 does your where do your growth opportunities fall regionally? Domestic versus international. Well, the biggest growth we've had in the last few years has been domestic and regional because we, you know, went from no aircraft to 20 aircraft flying uh, with Amazon, and we've also grown the uh, 767 fleet that we fly for DHL. Um, so a few years ago, in terms of uh, hours, because of course departures and hours, we used to be probably 90 percent plus international flight hours and 10 percent domestic. Or regional, I, I think it's probably a 20-ish plus percent domestic, and the balance being regional. But all hours have grown. We were 185,000, 178,000 hours in 2015, and we're north of 300,000 now. So, so a lot of growth in those few years. Okay. You mentioned China. Um, obviously, a lot of trade friction between the U.S. and China, and yet I believe you have said that uh, this is not yet hurting air freight. Could you explain for us? Well, I don't know Why if it's not? not hurting air freight, but the question is, and we were talking about it here at lunch, is, well, how big has that in impact been? And um, so far, so far, we haven't seen really a large impact. It, it, it doesn't mean that there hasn't been an impact, and it might be so early it's, it's hard to tell. Um, but some of the analysis that, that we, we, we've read, required, when you look at the 64 million tons that move internationally today in air freight, that, IATA's numbers. Um, the, the analysis looked at, well, between what's implemented and what's proposed in terms of tariffs, how much of that would be affected? And we think it's, well, the, what we've read, so that we think what we read, it's a, a little bit, uh, slightly above 1% of total air freight volumes would be impacted by tariffs. Now, will they stop moving? Will the importer be able to pass some of that cost increase on to their customer? Uh, it's, it's a little early to tell. Okay. If they stick in their onerous, you might, over a period of time, see manufacturing move. So maybe move out of China into Vietnam, uh, elsewhere in Southeast Asia. But that's not a tomorrow decision. That's going to take several years to really have the infrastructure in place to move. So, so far, some impact, hard to, hard to see. Hopefully, uh, it's in all of our interest in China, China as well, to find the accommodation and move forward and remove the uncertainty that exists. Okay. Something else we were talking about at, at launch was the pilot supply. Um, how are, are your relations with your pilot union? Yeah. Well, if we didn't have pilots, we wouldn't be in business, right? We're, we're selling a service. We're selling uh, the aircraft that we operate, but we operate it and maintain it and perform and operate the networks uh, for our customers. So, and and uh, because of the business we're in, our largest employee group is indeed our pilots. We're we have uh, more than 2,000 pilots now in the operation. So we're, right now we're negotiating a new joint collective bargaining agreement with our, with our pilots. At the end of that, Southern, that's when Southern will ultimately integrate into, into Atlas. We're keeping the two uh, certificates uh, until we get there. Uh, clearly, we have to get to an agreement that, that works for the pilots. It has to provide them the compensation and the terms and conditions that make them, I would want to make them come and join Atlas and stay. Uh, growth is important too. If you're joining the company, you want to think about, you know, what are my longer-term opportunities here as I move 
uh, through the different aircraft types and I move to the left seat and keep moving. So, so that's a focus of our, yeah, we have to compete just like every other airline does for our, for our pilots, but our goal is to become or be and continue to be the company people want to come and work. Well, along those lines, how worried are you about a, a pilot shortfall and what is Atlas Air doing to ensure that you have an adequate supply of pilots to meet your growth? Yeah, we're highly, we're, we're clearly focused on that, um, as I'm sure every other airline is as well. Uh, we've, when we say we doubled, we doubled our pilot uh, uh, workforce too in the last three years. We've gone from a thousand pilots to, to, to north of 2,000 pilots. We work with, uh, we're working with regional airlines, um, implemented and announced what we call pilot pathway programs. So as pilots come out of school and join uh, regional airlines and get some number of uh, hours of experience, uh, they're looking to move on and, 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 and I think the regional carriers too um, benefit from having um, a, a pathway that they can point to that, that says, you know, as you move through here, Assuming you qualify and all the other things, there are, there are opportunities for you at Atlas as you move through your career as a pilot. So one of the things we're doing. Okay. I think as an industry, uh, and I think uh, my friend uh, from FedEx w who was here back in the in, 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 uh, fourth quarter said, we just have to do a better job as an industry to you know, get the story out about what the career really is. The profession, uh, lifetime earnings opportunities, which are quite different than they were 20 years ago. And, and, and what, you know, what a person can, can do in a, with, a, with a very meaningful and responsible job. We have, we, we've got a long way to go, you know, as an industry, and, and we've got to certainly make sure we convey that as Atlas as well. Okay. Talk a little bit about your fleet. I know, um, I think you added 16 aircraft last year. Yeah. How, how many are you going to add? And I believe it's primarily 7.4s, 7.6.7s, and 777s. Yeah, so again, in the, in the last three years, we've added uh, 50 aircraft to the fleet. Uh, the largest growth has been in the 767s as we are ramping up to serve an to that's serve what you fly for, for Amazon, right? 76s? Is that what's I'm Where you fly for Amazon? Yes, we fly 27, okay. 67, uh, 300. But we've had, last year we added uh, eight f to complete the 20 for Amazon. We, we added a, just one 777, another 67, and then we um, added uh, six uh, 747s as well to meet other customer demand in the market. So we'll be somewhere around 115 aircraft right now. We don't have any firm orders out there uh, as of now, but you know, I think the growth opportunities in our business are good. Uh, our customers are growing, they're telling us, so I think the fleet will continue to grow. And do you have a projection for 2019, how much you'll grow? Well, we're gonna, we'll, talk, we'll talk about that in a few weeks when we give our earnings call, nice. but uh, I, 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 I think You can give that, these people a preview. Huh? <laughs> Yeah. No, I, I look, we're, we believe in the, in the long-term essential role that air freight plays in the global economy. Okay. And, and at, we believe it's going to continue to grow. And so we're going to have to invest to grow. One, one statistic you and I talked about before, if you think about the world's trading goods, so not oil, not iron ore, not fertilizer, but goods, including perishables, by weight, International, by weight, only 1% moves via air. But by value, 36% of the world's trading goods moves by air. So it's valuable, it's time definite, it's got to get there. Uh, consumers are changing and growing in their taste. Uh, world's population, greater than 50% of the world's population will live in cities over the next uh, 25 years. It's estimated about 2 billion people globally will enter the middle class, which means they have disposable income. They can buy things beyond the basic necessities, and that's, that's ubiquitous. So then you apply technology, and you look at the penetration of mobile phones and your ability to, to buy on your phone. So I think, more broadly speaking, that there's a, there's a well, it may have bumps one year over the other, but if you look you know, out five years or more, I think the growth opportunities are really significant. Okay. And we want to position ourselves to be part of that. So we'll have to have the fleet to do it. Great. Speaking of fleet, uh, I saw we had someone in our audience from Airbus. Uh, couldn't you see Atlas, can you see Atlas Air uh, buying Airbus aircraft, an A330 freighter, for example? I can. So I was reminiscing with, uh, with Barry Eccleston um, earlier because I think 
I'd, I'd been with Atlas all of about six weeks, joining from the freight forwarding industry, maybe not even six. And Barry and I met at the air show. I guess it was the London air show, Barry, I'm not sure. But we met and we've become uh, good friends ever since. Um, I think the uh, near-term opportunity with Airbus would be the converted A330-300 passenger plane. The hull values are a little rich right now. They're, it's a tremendous passenger plane. They're mostly in Asia. Uh, but a few are flying. Uh, uh, DHL Express has signed up for four. I don't know how many have been delivered, but at least two. Uh, I've spoken with the company that flies for, uh, for Airbus, and they're, they're, they now operate freighters. They're pretty happy with them. So as, as perhaps e-commerce and Express grows, as regional flying grow, the 330-300 will be great in the transatlantic trade as well. But there's a market there. Um, there's a market. Airbus has to want to commit to it as well because they have to support conversions. It's not easy, um, but could be. Okay. 100 years ago, nobody would have gotten on an elevator without an operator. Can you see a day when at an Atlas Air aircraft is, is flown without a pilot on board? And, and if so, how far off is that day? Well, time will tell, I guess. Um, I, I think in kind of the horizon that we're, we're looking at, and probably everyone in this room is looking at, um, there are pilots who are going to be flying planes. And maybe that'll change in the cockpit, some combination of how technology is employed. But, but, but for us, we're, we're not envisioning a, a pilotless future in long haul, large wide body uh, type operations. Maybe that'll change. Uh, we'll, we'll see. Certainly there's a lot of work been done. We look at what the military has been able to do, develop with the, you know, um, uh, you know their systems and, and, and the Navy fighter bomber that can land and take off a, a carrier. So there's, there's, there's opportunity. But I, going back to our earlier uh, points, you know, we should be doing all that we can to convey uh, to young people that there's a great opportunity as a pilot it, it's, it's not an industry or a profession that's, that's going away in the near term, and, and there may be some application of pilotless vehicles, but that's a ways off, I think. Okay. The technology may be there. There's all the social acceptance and safety and all the other considerations that come with so it. So a ways off. Huh? Your, your, so your answer is really a way, still a ways off. I'll be retired. <laughs> okay. <laughs> all right. You've been very vocal about the need for infrastructure modernization. Uh, our government can't even pay its aircraft controllers or security screeners right now. Um, how optimistic are you that this problem will be addressed, and, and how are we going to pay for it? Well, users will pay for it, um, for sure. But, but I think we missed a real opportunity um, in the last Congress because uh, Chairman Bill Schuster of Transportation Infrastructure uh, you know, launched a, a strategic and far-thinking initiative uh, around air traffic control, and, and to move it out of the, to move the air traffic control out of the uh, out of the FAA, have FAA focus on its safety mission, um, and then get a not-for-profit corporation to, to to operate the air traffic control system, like Canada and many other countries do, um, and it went very far, but ultimately couldn't get over the goal line, so. From our, from our point of view, that was a real opportunity lost. Our skies are safe, but the system we have today, our skies are constrained. You know, when you look at the airports, with most of you here in the New York area, on a day like today, uh, you know, there's real restriction. Uh, no one's going to operate unsafe. The FAA wouldn't allow unsafe operations. No air, airline would fly unsafe operations. Uh, but what, we, what we'll lose is capacity to grow. So there's, a, there, there's growth. And then on the other hand, when you look at the promises of modern air traffic control, less fuel burn, less emissions, right? More on-time arrivals, uh, uh, everything that, that uh, less other noxious uh, emissions as well. Um, ultimately, less noise, as you think about continuous descent and, and, and other things. It was a real opportunity lost. So it, it remains to see, be seen how going forward FAA and and, and now, uh, under uh, the leadership of uh, Chairman DeFazio, uh, the issues and concern haven't gone away. So how are we going to move forward with, with, uh, with, the, uh, with the regulators, uh, industry with regulators and, and Congress to finally get to modern air traffic control system? And, and, and what I said about users paying, it was going to be user-based. Users would pay. But if you think about the savings in fuel and, 
how many minutes you cut off a flight and everything else that goes along with that, right? it, it, it effectively pays for itself. So, I mean, Sh Chairman Schuster's gone. Do you, see yeah. a, uh, do you see someone else emerging as an advocate for some of these things? Well, I, I, you know, it is not, it, 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 it's not clear how Chairman DeFazio thinks about it. Sam Graves is ranking in, uh, in, on TNI now. He's a pilot. Uh, he understands the issue very well. Uh, he was able to represent what the, you know, GA concerns were, and those got fashioned in, into the bill. So it remains to be seen who would take up the mantle, or maybe it'll go in a different direction. You know, uh, we'll see what the FAA and, and DOT how, want to address it. Okay. Fuel prices account for obviously a big share of, of your expenses, and they've been the last few years all over the map. How do you, when when you're having to add fleet for years, how do you? How do you plan for the future? Well, a couple of things. So certainly when we're, so, so what we're doing is selling the service, right? It's the aircraft that's flown between points that our customers ask us to fly. So we have to be sure that we're off offering a fuel efficient aircraft, right? Because that gets down to the cost to move a kilo from A to B, and that's a, that's a part of it. That, and so that's, a that's clearly a focus for us when we think about fleet planning. But, but in our, our business, our ACMI, CMI, business, we don't have a lot of fuel exposure. We're providing the aircraft, the crew, and the operation. And we have the long-lived asset risk you know, on, on, on the aircraft. But our customers fill the plane, you know, so they're, they're, they're retailing the capacity for the most part. They're putting a price on that, and they're putting the fuel in the plane. So, so we only have fuel risk for about 15% of our flying, so we don't hedge. Um, but what we do is work very hard with our customers to make sure they're not burning a gallon more than they have to, helping them optimize the flights and their, their planning um, and, and all of the, uh, the different things you can do to minimize fuel burn because that's part of our value add to them as well, right? Yeah, but airlines would love that they could make their customers pay for the fuel. Well, uh, it's our model. And, and on the other hand, though, there's that, you know, we've got billions of dollars invested in, in assets that are on shorter rather than longer term placements. So we've got a and we've got to manage that risk and, and, and uh, residual value. We wanted to take some questions from the audience. Do we still have time to go, or should we open it? <coughs> Ask a couple more? OK. Um, what's the impact of additional tagging and screening rules for air cargo you know, and cost and time? So back in uh, June or July of this year, uh, you know, Chinese authorities implemented some new rules and requirements. But they're basically the same rules we have in the U.S. and, and Europe. So it wasn't something, you know, beyond. Okay. So it's, it's requiring the freight forwarders and the shippers to submit uh, more detail about the individual shipments, more detail about shipper and consignee, product that's being carried or delivered, addresses. I mean, the same information that, that U.S. customers would want. EU. So it's not, not excessive uh, in that sense. Uh, but there's an implementation. Part of what we're able to do is we're, we're, because we have that information, we're helping a few of our, our, our customers comply. Uh, Japan is likely to introduce something very similar uh, sometime in 2019. But, it, but it's almost kind of an international standard in, in uniformity. Ultimately, it should be easier for, for everybody to comply. Where we've seen some challenges in China um, is related to manufacturing is moving off the coast and into the interior. And that's a deliberate economic policy. So there are some of the airports that are growing up quickly, Hangzhou or, or Wuxi, for example, they're not necessarily fully staffed, right, with, the cut, with their own custom officials and other officials that need to be there to process it. I think uh, when you talked about can you tagging and moving cargo, you know, more quickly, you know, what we've been urging, uh, working with, working with uh, our authorities and ICAO, is implement ACAS, the Advanced Cargo Screening, uh, work closely uh, uh, with, uh, uh, again, uh, our authorities, implement third-party uh, canine screening uh, of cargo or uh, random screening of cargo, and get to something that looks like a trusted shipper program so that those trusted shippers that have regular and continuous volume that, that meet these other standards, and, and, and we think uh, third-party canine is a great opportunity for us, can can take that dwell or that wasted time out of the system uh, and, and help product just move through faster. Okay. 
We read today a, a lot of jitters about the global economy in different regions, you know, the U.S., China, um, Europe. What's your take on where the global economy is heading and, and what keeps you up at night? Well, I think the rate of growth in 2019 is going to be, be less than the rate of growth in 18 and 17. I don't know that that's a surprise. I mean, you can't have double-digit growth year after year after year in demand and not start to see, see it moderate as you get on to now two years comparable over, right? So that, I think that's part of it. I think you hit it earlier, though. Trade and tariffs, a lot of political uncertainty, right? Everywhere, it seems, or almost everywhere, it seems. So how does that affect consumer sentiment, investor sentiment? Um, how do you feel about you know, going out and buying a new iPad yourself kind of thing? So, so I think we're more concerned about uh, if we have these long-term kind of trade disputes and uh, economic uncertainty, our government's still closed. We were talking about what does that mean in our individual businesses. Yeah, that could have a, that could have a slowing effect. Okay, gotcha. Um, I had asked you in fleet about uh, A330s. Uh, you seem to really love the 747, particularly 747A. That's um, great what, what are the chances you could order some more 747A's, yeah. either for growth or as replacements for some of your 400s? Yeah, so we have 10 now, 747-8s and 26 or something, uh, 747 400s. 400s is very, still a great aircraft. Our newest builds are 2004 deliveries, so, so they've got a long life ahead of them. These aircraft typically operate uh, 30 plus years, and our earliest builds are 98, so, so they're just over that 20 mark. Uh, the 747 8 is a great freighter. Um, yeah, and I think long term uh, we'll need more long haul intercontinental aircraft. That could be a mix of 747s or 777s, or, or because you know, we also have the 777 platform as well. Okay, we'll, and we'll hear maybe more about that when you do your earnings, right? Yeah, well, we've got our colleagues from Boeing here, too. <laughs> okay, great. Do we want to take questions from the audience now? Because I know s several people told me they had questions. Um, Bill, last week, Gatwick was closed for quite a long time on account of a drone. We heard the same thing happened at Newark this week. Uh, have you reviewed in Atlas the, the threat of drones in the airspace? And if so, how do you think you'll handle it? Well, clearly aware of what happened you know, at Gatwick, and then we saw what, what was going on what was going on at Newark. So we think ultimately we'll work safe, closely with the regulators and the authorities and certainly be aware of conditions. And, and, um, and so what that led to was diversions and changes and, and drove a lot of costs into the system. But I think for now that's, that, that's what we know and that's more likely how we'd respond. Almost like any other hazard to flight. We, we, I was in Iceland last week remembering the, uh, reminiscing on the volcano and actually I actually got stuck in London for about 10 days there, but, but it's the whole safety of flight issue, right? And, and we'll respond appropriately. Okay. Any other questions? What do you think the uh, largest challenge for air cargo is in the future? Well, I think we, we talked about a couple of them. It's, it's um, so we're, in, we're at the center of the global economy. We're at you think about supply chains and, and, and how freight and product are moving. Uh, but still, it takes too long. You know, you got 12 hour flights, 13 hour flights, and product may be trapped in that net system for four days, right? From when the product is dropped off at the airport and when it's ultimately available for, for pickup. So, so we've, I think as an industry, we've got to take some of that dwell out, right? Just, it's, it's certainly not value creating to lose a day. In transit, and so that's working with the authorities. Uh, I, you know, to the extent that Chi the Chinese are going to implement very similar, similar, excuse me, uh, regulations, that should ease things. Um, and so I think better continued information sharing, the focus on process, um, given the concerns on safety and security, some of the things we talked about a moment ago, known, known trusted, or excuse me, not known, trusted shippers. Uh, there's a difference. Um, you know, can help can help move uh, product along quicker, and I think that enhances the value proposition overall for air cargo. No matter where you sit in the segment, you know, no matter where you sit in that value chain, I think that's that's uh, that's a part of it. Uh, we have to be able to fly, so we have to have pilot uh, supply, and all of us, is, and no matter what airline we're in, we have to do that. So we're, 
so we're keenly focused on that, um, and we've been able to, to, to manage our growth and, and um, deliver our growth, our two. And then I think this kind of uncertainty thing that we're dealing with, you know, and if I was reading a, an analysis of um, that Oxford uh, Analytica did, and it talked about, they were trying to do a compare and a contrast of if we continue to move through with open skies, if we continue to, you know, uh, grow trade and allow trade to flourish, if we break down barriers and those barriers for passengers, you know, they're envisioning a world of, of, of you know, 20% kind of growth over the next couple of years. And then they put up the protectionist case, right? And, so the, and they were comparing a protectionist case that compared uh, passenger miles uh, and every, uh, from down from every other segment of revenue, or excuse me, of our business. And it's about 80% of what they envision the, the more open uh, uh, environment and, and, and context to be. So I think that's another thing too. If we're getting into protectionism and barriers, if we somehow constrain open skies, um, I think ultimately that has some effect. Trade's not going to go away. It's just going to constrain uh, the rate of growth. What about Brexit? Does that impact you guys at all? Pricing? Br Brexit. Oh, Brexit. I'm sorry. Because we're reverberating here. <laughs> yeah, Brexit can't. Right now, we don't know what the Brexit agreement's going to be. Uh, we don't know how that affects EU carriers. The US and, and the UK have, have a, a, an open skies agreement that kind of mirrors that's what's in place. Um, right now, we don't have a lot of operations in the UK. Uh, Conversely, it might be an opportunity because supply chains are going to get disrupted, mm -hmm. and, and 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 perhaps we'll we'll have a role in, in the solution of a disrupted supply chain as a result of Brexit with continental flying, okay. continental supply chains. Okay, we have time for one more question, Sharon. Uh, with the plans for redevelopment of JFK, what part is cargo? Do you have a part in that redevelopment plan? Well, we're operating in in, in JFK today. Uh, we operate for DHL, and uh, we have a, uh, I guess it's a daily we have in, in, in JFK, a 747 that's coming in uh, from, uh, from Asia. We have quite a few charter flights in and out of, uh, in and out of JFK as well. We're not going to be developing uh, facilities there. We're, we'll serve uh, you know, the customers and the, the parties that use those facilities or are in the facilities for their own freight flow. So it's good to see. Thank you very much. Uh, that's you. it for questions. So first off, thank you both. Uh, thank you. Very thank, much. You. thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So Joe, as a memento, we have for you a uh, Medal of Honor coin. Okay. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you. And Bill, for you, we have a uh, plaque uh, Thank you. that reads, presented to William Flynn, in grateful appreciation for your presentation at the Aviation Leader Series of the Wings Club Foundation, January 2019. Thank you, Frank. Thank you very much. Thank you.